Hello and welcome to another video. Today's topic is rates of change. As you remember from our previous lesson, we talked about rate of change being a synonym for the word slope. We also talked about the rate of change being positive indicates that the function is increasing. We also talked about a negative rate of change indicating that a function is decreasing. In AP pre-calculus, we will define the rate of change of a function at a point as the rate in which the output or the y values would change if the input or the x values were to change at that point. Uh, let's focus for a little bit on positive slope, negative slope, and zero slope. Like I said before, we talked about positive and negative, and we're adding a new one, which will be the zero slope. If we look at this roller coaster picture at the bottom, we can see that at T1, we are going up, meaning we have a positive slope. If we look at T3, we can see that the roller coaster is going down, meaning I have a negative slope. If I change between increasing and decreasing, or decreasing to increasing, meaning at the top of the roller coaster or at the very bottom of the roller coaster, that will give me a average rate of change of zero every single time. We are going to be using positive slope, negative slope, and zero slope uh, to identify some information in our graph. And then we're also able to arrange the average rate of change from least to greatest without, have, without actually having to find it, depending on what is given to us. So looking at example one, they told us that the figure shows a graph of function f in the xy plane with the three points that are labeled. They're asking you to order the rates of change of f at the three labeled points from least to greatest. So you want to put the smallest one first and then the greatest, uh, the greater ones after that. So looking at our three points, we notice that for a, I have a positive slope or a positive rate of change. So I'm going to make a note, positive rate of change. Again, I can see my y values. They are increasing, or you can also do it with the arrow. If I look at B, I notice that I have a negative rate of change. Because again, I am decreasing, I can see my arrow going down. If I look at C, I notice that my function is changing at C from decreasing to increasing right here. So I know that my slope at C is going to be zero or zero average rate of change. So looking at this information, I have a positive, I have a negative, and I have a zero. So if I want to order them from the least to the greatest, I know that the least is going to be B because it's negative. I know that the next one is going to be C because it's zero. And then I know that the greatest one is going to be A because it's a, pos it's a positive. If you forget, you can always refer to your number line, so it doesn't really matter what numbers you put on them. If you look in your number line, the negatives are always the smallest ones, and then zero will always be in the middle, and then four will be the largest one. So the order uh, in which you want to put them, if it's from least to greatest, in this case you will go from left towards the right, and then put your negatives first, then your zero, and then your positive. Uh, please make sure that you write your answer in a full sentence uh, as you do the problems. Example number two, it says that the figure shows the graph of function g in the xy plane with four label points this time. And they're asking you of the following points, at which is the rate of change of g the least. So I'm going to do what I did earlier and see if that can help me out. So I know that a has a positive average rate of change. Positive
I know that B also has a positive rate of change. And then I see that C has a negative rate of change. And then I see that D has a negative rate of change. Looking at our answer choices, I know that uh, A and B are going to be greater than C and D because they are the positives that will be on the right side of my number line so I can cancel out A and B. After that, I'm going to be between C and D. They are both negative. If we remember some information from the previous lesson, if you remember concavity, all that part that I just highlighted in green is concave down. If you remember the definition for concave down, we remember that every time that my graph is concave down, the rate of change is going to be decreasing as you go from left to right. So if I follow my graph, as I go to the right, as I'm highlighting in red, the rate of change will get smaller and smaller, and it will keep on decreasing. So based on that, D is on the farther right side of the graph compared to C, so D will be my answer. Again, making a connection to lesson 1.1 and the definition of concave down. If you had a zero, then it will be easy, but keep in mind that that will happen if they are part of the same graph. Uh, we are going to talk about the average rate of change and how we can use two intervals to find the rate of change or the average rate of change between those x values. Uh, before we do that, we can look at example number three. Uh, example number three says that the figure shows the graph of the function y equals h of x of the following, which interval is the average rate of change of h the greatest. So instead of looking at one point, now we're gonna be looking at two x values and we're gonna connect that with a line and then look at the average rate of change between the two points. The first two points are going to be 2 and 3. So they're right here. Draw your straight line between 2 and 3. We can see that it's a horizontal line. Remember, the horizontal line have a slope of 0. So I'm just going to put 0 for 2 and 3 right here. I'm going to switch colors and look at the numbers for between 3 and 5. And then you see that it's decreasing, so I'm going to have a negative average rate of change. If I look at, uh, at the next interval, which is between 5 and 7, which is right here, I can see that I have a positive slope. And then if I look at the average rate of change between 7 and 8. Again, I can see that I'm decreasing and I have a negative slope. So I'm trying to figure out if I can solve this problem without actually finding the average rate of change, just using the zeros, positives, and negatives. Since I'm looking for the greatest, I know that my answer will be C because it's the only one that is positive. The other ones are gonna be smaller than that one because I have two negatives and a zero. So I know that the one with the positive will be the correct answer just by labeling that. Next, we're gonna be looking at word problems and we're gonna be using word problems to figure out if my rate of change is positive or if my rate of change is negative. As you do the problems, don't forget that your x has to always be increasing. And then your y can be increasing or decreasing depending on the situation. So example number four, it says to identify which one of the situations models a situation with a negative rate of change. Visually, 
my graph will start like that and then my y values will continue to decrease. It can be curved, it can be a straight line, uh, or it can be somewhere in between. So looking at example A, it says x equals the age in years of a young child and y is the height in inches of the young child. So if you look at the initial height of a child when they're born, they're born very small and then as they get older and older, their height will increase. So that will give me a positive rate of change. Uh, if I look at B, the total number of points scored in the basketball game versus Y, the total time remaining in seconds in the game. Again, as the time keeps on increasing, the points on the scoreboard will increase as the time remaining will decrease. So you start with 48 minutes in the game. As you keep going in the game, that time remaining will decrease until you get to zero. Uh, so then B will be the correct answer. If we look at C, the time in seconds since the ball was thrown up straight in the air and then the height uh, in feet of the ball. So for that one, if I look at the situation, I will have to throw the ball up in the air. It will come up to a point and then it will start falling. So in this case, I have a positive rate of change and a negative rate of change. So that's why C is incorrect. And then for D, if you look at the radius of a circle versus the area of the circle, so if I have a circle here with a radius, if I increase the radius, the area will also increase, creating a positive rate of change as well. So yes, I went through all of them just to make sure that we understand kind of how it works and how we can use the words to solve the problems. Uh, example number five. It says for each scenario below, determine whether the two quantities typically have a positive rate of change or a negative rate of change, and you want to explain why. A, the age of a child versus the height. We kind of already talked about that one on the previous problem. It's going to be positive because as the kid gets older, the height will also increase. B, says the golfer skill level versus the golfer score. It is important to note that your goal in golf is to score uh, the lowest uh, amount of points possible. Because basically when you're scoring golf, you're scoring the number of swings it takes you to complete the whole course. So it works kind of backwards. A small score means that you're a really good golfer. So as your skill level gets better, the score should be lower. You do become a better player, but again, your goal is to have the lowest score possible. Uh, C says the, the height of the ground of a coin drop from the top of the reunion tower versus the speed that it falls. So as it falls, the speed will increase and then the height will decrease. And then this one will create a negative rate of change. We are gonna talk about finding the rate of change uh, using the formula that was given to us right here. So this is the formula to find the average rate of change, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. In order for you to be able to use the average rate of change formula, you will need to find the y values of the function over the given interval. So find the y values first using the x1 and x2 that are given to you. After that, you're able to find the average rate of change using between the two points using the formula. So let's practice um, using this formula. We are gonna be doing different representations. We are gonna start with equations. Then we will move on into uh, graphs and then we're gonna use the calculator uh, for questions eight and nine and then one of them will be using the table as well. Um, well. Let's start with the first example for number six. It says find the average rate of change for the following functions on the given interval. For A, this is my equation that was given to me. f of x equals negative x cubed 
plus 3x. And then this is my interval uh, from negative 2 to negative 1. So I'm going to label these as x1, as x2. That is different from algebra 2. In algebra 2, we were used to given x1, y1. Now we were given a domain interval, which means that they are giving me both of my x values. So if you remember from above, we need to find the y values first, depending on the representation, before we start finding the formula. So in this example, I'm plugging in uh, negative 2 into my formula to find f of negative 2 first and then I plug it into my formula. Don't forget everywhere you have a parenthesis. Since I have two parentheses, two replacements will need to be made. So the first negative came from the equation. The negative 2 was replaced with the x and then cubed and then plus 3 and then the second x got replaced with negative 2. I have a negative at the very front and then I'm gonna cube negative 2, so negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2. Well, these two will give me positive 4 times negative 2, which will give me negative 8 when I simplify that parentheses first. So I'm going to put negative 8 in parentheses. After that, I'm just going to multiply 3 times negative 2, which will give me negative 6. I do notice that I have two negatives, so that will become a positive. So that will be 8 minus 6, which is equal to 2. This will be my y1 because the x value that I used to plug it in came from x1. I am going to repeat the same step to find f of negative 1, which is going to be negative times negative 1 quantity cubed plus 3 times negative 1. When I do that, I have a negative in the front. Negative 1 cubed will be negative 1. And then negative 1 times 3 will be negative 3. I do notice that I have two negatives, so they'll be turning into a positive. And then I will have 1 minus 3, which is negative 2. This one came from x2, so this will give me my value for y2. After that, I'm ready to plug into my formula. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. I know that y2 is negative 2 based on what I found, minus y1, which is positive 2, over x2, which is negative 1, minus x1, which is negative 2. This one has a double negative because the first negative came from the equation, and then the second negative came from my x1 actually being negative as well. I can turn those two into a positive, and then I get negative 4 over positive 1, I can simplify that to negative 4. So I can say the average rate of change of f over the interval negative 1, negative 2 to negative 1 is equal to negative 4. I repeat, the average rate of change of f over the interval negative 2 to negative 1 is equal to negative 4. You can do the same thing with b. You're just going to have to do it with fractions. So I'm going to erase this so we're able to see it. Again, we're going to follow the same exact steps. We're going to label this as x1. This will label this as x2. I need to find h of 1, and I need to find h of 4. Uh, when I find h of 1, all I'm doing is replacing my x's with 1. So it'll be 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 6. 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 and then 1 plus 6 is 7. So h of 1 is equal to 2 over 7. I am going to repeat the same steps for 4. So 4 plus 1 over 4 plus 6. So that will give me 5 over 10, which simplifies to 1 half. After that, I'm going to label them. This will be y1 and this will be y2. So y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 y2 is 1 half, y1 is 2 over 7, over x2, which is 4, minus 1. I cannot do anything because I don't have the same denominator at the top, and I'm subtracting two fractions. 
I know I need to change both because I can't make a 2 into a 7 by multiplication and I can't make a 7 into a 2. So the right side is going to be multiplied by 2 over 2 and the left side is going to be multiplied by 7 over 7. After that, if you remember, you multiply fractions across. So I'm going to do 7 times 1, which is 7. 7 times 2, which is 14. Minus, and then I'm going to repeat the same steps on the other side by just multiplying. 2 times 2, which is 4 over 14 over 4 minus 1, which I know is 3. After that, I have the same denominator, so I'm able to subtract them. 7 14 minus 4 14 will give me 3 out of 3 over 14. And then I'm going to divide by 3. I have, I have a fraction divided by a number. So to make this simpler, I'm going to make the denominator into a fraction as well. And then I'm dividing a fraction by a fraction. If you remember, I need to keep the numerator the same. I want to multiply the fraction. And then I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal of the denominator. So instead of 3 over 1, I'm going to multiply by 1 over 3. After that, I notice that these two can be divided out, giving me a 1. So I'm only left with 1 over 14, which will be my average rate of change. It's the same process as the other one. It just becomes a little bit longer when you have fractions. If you have a graph, it's actually easier because you can find the points using the graph. So again, I'm going to do the same thing, x1, x2. And then I'm going to use my graph to figure out what my y values are. So I need to find f of negative 1, and I need to find f of 3. What does it mean to find f of negative 1? It's giving me the x value, and I'm finding the y value when x is equal to negative 1. So I'm going to come into the graph, and I see that the y value when x is negative 1 is equal to 0. I'm going to repeat the same steps. When x is equal to 3, my y value is equal to 4. After that, I can label them. This is going to be y1 because it came from x1. And this will be y2. After that, I'm going to plug them into my formula. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. y2 is 4. y1 is 0. x2 is 3. And then x1 is negative 1. Again, the neg first negative is from the equation. Second negative is from your actual value. Plus plus here. So 4 minus 0 is 4. 3 plus 1 is 4. When I simplify that, I get 1. So the average rate of change of g over the interval negative 1 to 3 is equal to 1. These uh, next question, I'm going to do some of the examples with you because I don't want to get this video to be too long and then you can finish the rest on your own. Example number eight, you can do it using the calculator, using the home screen, or you can do it using the graphing and then the tracing. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open my calculator and then I'm going to show you how to do it on the home screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the y value for both uh, of the x1 and x2 that they gave me for answer choice A uh, using the home screen. So 3.16. I'm just going to go into my calculator and type 3.16 uh, plus 4.2. Then I'm going to replace my x with negative 10. So 4.2 times negative 10. And then I'm going to close the parentheses. And then minus 0 0.85. Minus 0 0.85. Open parentheses again. And then my x value that I'm plugging in first is negative 10. Then I am going to uh, square it. Mm. 
So that will give me the y value, which is negative 123.84. So I'm going to say f of negative 10 is equal to negative 123.84. Negative 123.84. I am going to repeat the same step for f of 8.348. But instead of writing it, I'm just going to go into my calculator, copy that number, and everywhere I have a negative 10, I'm going to replace it with the actual number that I want, which was. 8.348, 8.348. Don't forget to change it if you have multiple x's, which is which I do, and then I'm going to replace the other one, 8.348. If you're using an inspire, you can just go use the up arrow to highlight the function that you want to copy and then press enter, and then that will give you the answer that you want. So negative 21.0141. Negative twenty one point zero one four one zero one four one. After that, I'm just going to go into my calculator and do y two minus y one over x two minus x one. Looking at this, this is going to be my y one. This is going to be my y two because this was my x one and this was my x two. So plugging it in. Y2 is negative 21.0141 minus negative 123.84 over 8.348 minus negative 10. You can input all of this in your calculator together. So that's what I'm going to do. To help me out, I'm going to do the control divide giving me the two boxes to divide, which in my case is just right here. For you, you're going to have to do uh, control divide. So negative uh, 21.0141, you can also copy it, minus negative 123.84. And then in the bottom, we are going to put uh, 8.348, 8.348 minus negative 10. Press enter. I am going to make a note that the first rate of change is 5.6042. 5.6042. So you will repeat the steps for B, C, and D. Keep in mind that some of the values will be recycled, so you don't have to input them into your calculator. Like for example, when you do C, you don't have to repeat the steps for finding f of negative 10 because you already have them based on A. After that, they're asking you uh, which one of them is correct. In this case, we already found the answer because it says that it has a positive rate of change. When I found the rate of change, I found that my rate of change was 5.6032, which is positive. If you uh, do it and it doesn't work the first time, you'll have to continue going until you find the correct answer. Uh, but the steps will be the same um, no matter how many times you have to do it. You might have to do it four times, uh, but please make sure that you do it correctly to make sure that you get your answer. Uh, example number nine, they want to know, they want to know which one has the greatest uh, average rate of change. So you are going to have to find all four of them and compare them. I will do one of them with you just to make sure that you know how to do it. And then after that, uh, you can do the rest and find the actual answer to the problem. So here I'm doing from 1800 to 1850. So these are the only points that I'm going to be using that I circle. So I can do x1, x2, and then y1, y2. My formula, it doesn't matter which representation I'm doing, y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. 
So in this case, y2 is 46.10, uh, y sub 1 is 41.24 over x2, which is 1850 minus 1800. Uh, so after that, you will just uh, you can just go directly into your calculator and put your answer 46. I'm going to do the control divide again, just to make my life a little bit easier. Uh, you can do the same thing in your calculator. So here I'm going to do 46.10. 46.10 minus. 41.24 over 1850 minus 1800, which is just going to be 50. You can do that in your head very quickly. Press enter, and then it will give me a rate of change of 0 0.0972. 0 0.0972. Okay, so I will continue the process for B. C and D, and then again, don't forget you are trying to find the one with the greatest rate of change. And the process will be the same, you just have to make sure that you label correctly and you use the two points in the interval that is given to you for the answer choices. Thank you for watching the video, and hopefully you will learn something today. Thank you and have a great day.